DJ Ghetto Steve. Welcome to my channel. Welcome back if you've been here before. We are going to talk a little bit about the Institute in Basic Life Principles. This is the series of seminars and books that was put together by Bill Gothard and was very popular within the independent fundamentalist Baptist movement. Uh, so of course that's the, the Duggars and whatnot. And so Ginger just came out with her, vid well, interviews and or her book about how she left the IBLP and the way that it seemed like a works based uh, salvation rather than salvation through faith, which she has found in the Calvinists. Uh, so I, I definitely want to take a look at some of the materials uh, that are used for these seminars. Uh, we're going to start today with the men's manuals because of course, it's all about teaching you gender, gender roles and, and what part you're supposed to play. So, you know, we're, we're going to look at the men's manual because I haven't gotten a hold of the women's yet. But it basically details how to be a godly man and a godly husband, godly father, all that. So the first book, the first volume of the, the men's manual is primarily about ensuring the spiritual soundness of your family, ensuring that everyone has a really solid faith walk, uh, devotional practice, prayer practice, etc. And so you're not bringing in any influences that will cause any kind of doubt in your faith or uh, they call them bad seed thoughts um, because those things lead to rebellion and rebellion will lead to falling away from the faith. So I, of course, had to wear my cult hoodie. Uh, shout out to Bayside. But let's let's dive into my notes here. I am going to try and show you uh, some stuff in the books themselves so y'all can get a, a feel for what it looks like. It's a very interesting set of books. So here. We OK, so men's manual volume one. Let's see here. So we are talking about spiritual danger, God's standards. I love this be a man part. That's that's fun. Uh, be strong. Be kind. So there is an interesting <laughs> choices that have been made to uh, decide what to include in here and what to not include. Uh, now this is for fathers and grandfathers. Uh, note this is not intended for just your general run-of-the-mill guy. Uh, it, it needs to be someone who is in authority over others because this is all about setting up the father to understand his roles and responsibilities in being the spiritual head of the family and the umbrella of authority over everyone. So one of the things I think this does actually that, that is a good idea um, is to set up these weekly meetings with your family uh, to go over a particular value or character trait and how they can see it more or less in their life, depending on what it is, and just kind of check in with each other each week on how they're feeling about how they are practicing the values that you are instilling in them. So that, that I think, I mean, I'm all about meetings and being able to have a structure for uncomfortable conversations, because I do not think nearly enough of us have been given the full communication tools that, that we really need. Now, now let's, <laughs> let's, move on to why um, we have issues. So we have the why do wives react? Uh, this is pretty problematic. Uh, so it basically is a list of things that 
the father would do that would cause the mother to lose confidence in him, to not see him as an authority, to not go to him with everything and and be the only go to. When a husband fails to be a spiritual leader, his wife feels insecure. When a husband allows problems to continue and get even worse, his wife feels helpless and finally takes matters into her own hands. That's that's pretty fair. You know, if if someone is expected to be a leader and then does not follow through, it would make you feel insecure about your choices of choosing that person as a life partner. Like, mm, maybe we didn't understand our arousal, but we thought we did. Uh, if a husband praises or admires another woman, his wife feels inferior and jealous. And I'm like, is it? not possible for you to praise a woman without hitting on her because I mean people work with those of the opposite sex and you could have a co-worker that did a really good job about something and be like telling your wife yeah I was working on this project with uh, Brenda and she really helped me out with this and the 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 macros that she put together were fantastic. But that should not cause insecurity. If it does, probably should be in couples counseling. Uh, now here's one that that Paul listened to this one. When a husband verbalizes love only when he wants a physical relationship with his wife, his wife feels degraded and used and finds it hard to love him. And then let's see. When a husband neglects home repairs, his wife builds up resentment and impatience. Fair. Uh, when a husband loses his temper and does not ask for forgiveness, his wife reacts to his pride. I, I don't think she'd be reacting to the pride. I'm, I'm pretty sure she would be reacting to the, the yelling and whatever else was part of losing his temper. When a husband does not have good manners or consistent manners, his wife loses self-worth and feels isolated from her husband's real world. Y'all are putting a lot of emphasis on which fork to use here. So if he doesn't open the door for you every single time, that means you have no worth. Honey, you... <laughs> this is why you cannot find your self-worth in a partner. Ugh, no. Anyways... <laughs> triggered um so here we go uh before adam and eve sinned god established the husband's headship he created man first and gave him tasks to perform then god created the woman i will make him a help meet for him the hebrew word for help means to aid or assist it's usually what it means in English too. Uh, if Eve was created to aid Adam, it is logically assumed that Adam was to have the leadership position. He had to provide direction or his wife would not have known how to aid or assist him. So she's a completely inept, clueless person who can't look at a situation and go, hey, I should probably try doing this to help out has to have direction sure buddy god established the wife's submission uh eve was in submission to adam this is clearly indicated by scripture in order for eve to have fulfilled her function as an aid or assistant she would have had to be in submission to the one she was aiding i've helped a lot of people without being in submission to them the purpose and submission of the woman in God's creation order is reaffirmed in 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 10. I'll throw that up on the screen. 
Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, this was corrupted. And so then women became desiring of their husband, which Bill Gothard interprets as thy desire shall be to control thy husband. He added the control. That's not in the verse. So, mm, yeah, this is very similar to saying that babies are manipulative and children are sinful from birth. There is basically Adam and the father who are somehow still sinful. I mean, Adam still fell. He still ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he somehow is, is okay. So he gets to make decisions, but the, the wife and the children cannot make any decisions because they're incapable of that. Anyhow, why do children rebel? Some of these totally agree with. Uh, when a father does not fulfill promises, his children get wounded spirits. When a father refuses to ask for forgiveness, his children react to his pride. When a father does not have the right priorities, his children feel that he is too busy for them. Or you had 12 kids and it's impossible to split yourself 12 ways. Uh, if this, this one's funny to me. When a father puts his parents in a nursing home for the sake of convenience, his children are taught to reject older people. What a way to invalidate the struggle that it is to care for the elderly, especially if they have memory issues or other major chronic conditions. I mean, yeah, I guess it's convenience to to not have to work as a CNA in your own home. But come on now, a little grace here, a little grace. Uh, this one I, I do like when a father disciplines in anger, his children have seeds of bitterness. Totally, totally. Uh, that is why you see so many studies where children who were spanked um, frequently have behavioral issues uh, as adults and, and trauma. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's not helpful. When a father tries to warn his children only of the consequences of sin, his children are challenged to be successful in avoiding the consequences. Now, if that doesn't describe so many of the, the Christian kids that I grew up around. It's all about avoiding those consequences. Don't get caught. Get real good at not getting caught. Yeah. This one is weird, okay? So when a father lets his wife assume spiritual leadership, his children may regard religion as childish when they grow older. So infantilizing the women something that the woman likes. Oh, that's just, that's just silly childish stuff. And, and something that the father is into. Oh, well, that's, that's serious. That's respectable. The way that they teach these children to, I mean, they, they talk about respect so much, but they basically teach children to disrespect their mother because she's inferior to their father. And you can try and call it complementarianism, submission, all you want. It's inferiority. And it's no wonder then that they have so many of those why women react uh, that are that are based around insecurity. You, it, <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. So in the, the beginning, when they're talking about the uh, family meetings every week, um... I really like this uh, approach for for couples who are having communication issues, families, roommates, 
polycules. It's it's just a really good practice and and is very helpful. Um, you may not need to use that same structure forever, but it's it's good to have that structure in place while you're getting used to the uncomfortable conversations. Uh, so in the polyamory world, uh, this is called a radar meeting. Radar stands for review, agree on the agenda, discuss, action points, and reconnect. So in a radar meeting, you're going to start by saying, okay, here is what went well this week. Here is what I think can be improved. And you discuss those things and you, well, you agree on the agenda. Like, yeah, we're going to touch on these points. And then you discuss, uh, then you come up with action items. So actionable things that you can do, you know, ways that you can modify your behavior, change the way you're saying something or, you know, just have more understanding on a particular topic. Uh, but then you, you get those action points together and then you reconnect. You snuggle on the couch and, and watch a movie or you go for a walk together or, you know, just something to, to get the warm fuzzies, to wrap up this uncomfortable conversation with uh, emotional and neurochemical reward. Uh, so, so having these on a regular basis, you can come in and say, Hey, yeah, last week we had these action items. I think we did really well on these. I think we could still work on these agree on those, you know, opportunities to talk about, discuss, create new action points. And so you're, you're constantly in this process of being self-aware and that more than anything makes a huge difference in in relationships when you can be self-aware and recognize when you're doing certain things it's a lot easier to to stop yourself before you you get too carried away and say things you don't mean so anyways that is my soapbox on radar meetings one other thing from the the reason children rebel it says when a father delegates his children's education to others they cease to respect him as a teacher it's silly to to put this emphasis on you can only have one person and whether that is one friend or one teacher or one spiritual leader like that that just is a recipe for disaster i mean you should have a a wide variety of influences and and information because if you're listening to just one person it is so easy to get sucked into something really harmful and really toxic because you don't know any different. You're only listening to them. They are your spiritual authority. So that's just how it goes. And it, this, I mean, these people following Bill Gothard, like he was, a lecherous man and yet thousands of people followed his purity standards that were to an insane degree and there is a lot of implied incest in it um we'll we'll get to that a little bit later um it's it's just gross like it it assumes so many horrible things about people that that just aren't borne out in reality most of the time yes josh duggars exist but not every boy is feeling pulled to molest his sisters Anyhow, like I said, we will get into that later. I, this book was written in uh, the 80s. So 
the context of that time frame is the AIDS epidemic and the broad hatred of the LGBT community because they were these pervy, predatory, uh, uh, pathogenic. Uh, but yeah, they, they just had zero issues being absolutely awful about dehumanizing gay people, especially gay men. That is the context of, of this time frame, right? And so Bill Gothard writes, if a son or daughter rejects the design of unchangeable physical features, he or she will also tend to reject the designer and his authority in daily living. I don't remember really hearing anything about trans people until the 90s. So I'm I'm kind of surprised uh to to see this um I'm wondering though if it also could have uh related to people getting like boob jobs and nose jobs and stuff. And it, it's funny to me that those are called unchangeable features when they are by virtue of these procedures existing, very changeable. Especially boobs. I mean, come on. You can... Changing your hormones will do that. Drinking too much soy milk will do that. Ugh. Maybe we should do a mini episode on uh, bad Bill Gothard anatomy. A child who violates God's moral laws will experience guilt, which if not dealt with, will produce rebellion against the parents, the Bible, and God. Now, let's look at this from another side. If the son or daughter is not violating their own morals, but is violating the parents' morals. If the parents insist that their way is better, if the parents insist that the child come back to truth, etc., and put guilt on them, then yes, they will experience guilt. Which, if not dealt with, as in, if you cannot make peace, it will produce rebellion. And that is how children go no contact. Now, next, we're going to talk about 10 scriptural convictions that everyone must have. So here's our statement of faith, basically. The Bible is the inspired word of God and the final authority for my life. My purpose in life is to seek God with my whole heart and to build my goals around his priorities. My body is the living temple of God and must not be defiled by the lusts of the world. My church must teach the foundational truths of the Bible and reinforce my basic convictions. My children and grandchildren belong to God, and it is my responsibility to teach them scriptural principles, godly character, and basic convictions. My activities must never weaken the scriptural convictions of another Christian. My marriage is a lifelong commitment to God and my marriage partner. My money is a trust from God and must be earned and managed according to scriptural principles. My words must be in harmony with God's word, especially when reproving and restoring a Christian brother. But I thought we weren't supposed to weaken the convictions of another Christian. My affections must be set on things above, not things on the earth. So this gets back to the the most basic creeds that we saw in my Creeds and Confessions video. So it basically boils down to we believe in Jesus. He is the God. He is part of a trinity. Uh, he died for our sins. And we celebrate communion. So all of the 
predestination, premillennialism, post-tribulation rapture, um, all that stuff is, is to be determined. So remember, this is the independent fundamentalist Baptist. Now, IFB, some people will say, doesn't actually exist because it's not an institutionalized structure. It is a loose association of many independent churches. So often you will see differences in more minor pieces of doctrine um, between these, these churches. However, they are only going to associate with those that have very similar, or at least some sort of compatible uh, set of beliefs, because they they do believe in ecclesiastical separation. If we're just reinforcing what we already think, is that not listening to the lusts of the flesh? If a church is telling you something different, Maybe you should think about it. But again, ecclesiastical separation. So they've already made up their mind and they're only going to associate with people who agree with them or agree enough with them. Okay, here's here's a fun list of things that the dad can do to mess things up. Okay, make sure mom isn't reading any books or magazines that could plant wrong seed thoughts in her mind. Make sure everyone is properly Christian, or sorry, make sure everyone's friends are properly Christian. Do you know anything about your kids' teachers? Though they also said that you shouldn't trust their education to someone else because then the child won't respect you as a teacher. Many dialectics uh, <laughs> is the charitable way to put it. Have you ever expressed doubts? Have you ever told jokes about the Bible or its standards? Have you ever said others take the Bible too literally? Have you ever used profanity? Have you ever told your family to ask someone else a spiritual question because you were unsure of the answer? So just wing it. Make it up as you go. If you don't know it, because they will lose respect for you if you tell them to ask the pastor. Now, if you've do, done any of these things, you are to confess and ask for forgiveness. I appreciate people who can say, hey, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But not having the answer to a question and having to say, I don't know. Here's a resource that will know better than me. That's, that's just insane to me. How are you going to maintain respect for authority if authority gives you bullshit answers to things because they don't know? And then a little bit down the road, you by yourself or through another influence figure out that that's wrong, like obviously wrong. They, they shoot themselves in the foot by trying to desperately cling so tightly to that that authority of the ultimate authority of the father that that mimics god it feels feels a little blasphemous too we have seven principles for detecting spiritual danger so there is the principle of design first and foremost and that is the unchangeable physical features Principle two, the principle of authority, and that is that God-ordained hierarchy of God, Father, Mother, Children. Then we have the principle of responsibility, because we are personally responsible for our actions, unless we're a guy who's horny and a woman is wearing leggings. Then it's our fault. Uh, the principle of ownership, everything is dedicated to God, so we won't deal with worry or concern about our rights. So bodily autonomy, nah, don't need it. They, they effectively dehumanize people other than men in charge because they are, if you cannot have ownership of yourself 
what are you? Are you a, a puppet? Are you a clone? I mean, if, if you're not being true to who you are, if you are not able to make decisions for yourself, like, that, that's where um, Morgan has said um, she certainly wouldn't want to live by her own priorities and goals and whatnot. Uh, you have Ginger who in her book talked about how having control over her life and being able to make adult decisions without having to run it by dad uh, was was scary and was overwhelming and she didn't want that. They They set these, especially women and children, up to to have no faith in themselves, to not feel capable of much of anything. They can certainly make them feel capable uh, about yelling at people outside an abortion clinic or praying over people at church or witnessing to their friends or witnessing to a co-worker, you know, that they will allow them to feel proficient in. But anything that's actually going to serve them in adult life it's completely disregarded. It's invalidated. It is it is destroyed. Next we have on the topic of destruction, the principle of suffering. So the Christian martyr persecution complex is a well-known phenomenon and this bakes it into the theology. That And I, this is with a number of churches, not just Bill Gothard, but you will be hated for my sake, is what Jesus said. So because you follow me, people are going to hate you. And they they take this as license to be hateful, bigoted words they want to say. Because they're just doing what God would do. And so it's not that they're being assholes. It's that everyone else hates God. It's not that we hate their specific behaviors and the way that they go about things. Nah, we just hate God. It's very frustrating to talk to somebody who is deep, deep in that. Because... Any questioning or doubt is uh, passed off as as the world. It is Satan trying to get in your mind. And so listening to someone tell you, hey, standing outside an abortion clinic yelling at people doesn't do anything to help. And it's it's a dick move. They they can't accept that they can't agree with that they can't take it in because oh they're just hating on me because they hate god next we have the principle of freedom and they have a very interesting definition of freedom so freedom is not the right to do what we want but the power to do what we ought to there is certainly something to be said for recognizing that freedom in the context of a society does not mean that you are free to do whatever. You cannot yell fire in a movie theater. You cannot murder someone. Um, you, you do have limitations on that freedom. But, but when it is used in this religious context, it is so manipulative. You have to do it, and if you feel like you can't, it means that you're not trusting God enough, and, and you need his power to have freedom, to do what he wants. Yeah. And then finally, we have the principle of success. So here's our prosperity gospel. Uh, God will give us success if we follow his commands. That has terms and conditions. 
exclusions uh, apply. So we'll we'll get into the details on success later. Uh, one one interesting aside is he talks about rebellion and witchcraft because they are the same thing apparently. Witchcraft is a devastating sin, but God states that the sin of rebellion is just like the sin of witchcraft. 1 Samuel uh, 15, 23. Both sins take us out from under God's protection and put us under the destructive power of Satan. God places every person under authority, the authority of parents, government, godly church leaders, and employers. Every human authority, however, is under the authority of God and the Bible. As long as we are under God-ordained authority, Satan cannot get to us uh, with his destructive temptations. If we get out from under the protective covering of our authority, however, we expose ourselves to the realm and the power of Satan's control. So to speak to Ginger's book and her interview, um, this is very much a a works-based gospel because we have, you know, this, this protection from Satan is supposed to come from God, but you can only access it if you're under your umbrella of protection. So whether that is under your mother, your father, a pastor, whatever, you, you have to stay under their control. You're only safe in eternity if you stay under someone else's control. I always knew that that was kind of the vibe when I was watching uh, the Duggars years ago. And I felt so bad for those kids because you could see it. It weighed on them. Um, they, they had trouble figuring out what their own thoughts were because everything was just spoon fed to them. And if they tried to get something outside of the spoon feeding, it was seen as sinful and, and putting herself or himself in danger. After this, they do make a good point. Uh, they say to teach from a corrected failure, not just a failure. So you show kids how to move through failures and come out the other side better off, not just be upset at the consequences that you received after doing X, Y, Z. That is, that is a really good way to look at it because I think it is all too often someone will say, hey, I did X, Y, Z, you should not do it. So you could tell a kid, yeah, I, I lost my temper at, at work because of a horrible client that I was working with. And so I got fired because I lost, lost my temper. That could be the end of the lesson. Don't lose your temper because it could make you lose your job. However, you could take it a step deeper and, and tell them, you know, yeah, I lost my temper, lost my job. And so then I went to therapy and started learning coping skills to deal with anger and talk through issues that I have so I am more at peace with myself and do not have so much latent anger underneath the surface. You, you show them not just the problem, but the fix. And yeah, I mean, there, there can be many fixes for things, but, but showing them a path through is a very good start. There was such a dig on one of these pages. Is there a unique, non-offensive way to let my family realize how little they know about the Bible? How would you ask them what they do know? I mean, way to assume that they know nothing. Like, I mean, it's, it feels like this is assuming that the, the family that is reading these manuals has been backslidden Christians who do not read the Bible, do not pray, do not go to church, wear immodest clothing, swear, whatever. And, and those are the people that are going to go to an Institute in Basic Life Principles seminar and sit through hours and hours of legalistic, authoritarian, patriarchal evangelicalism? 
that's that's a hard sell. I I would be very surprised. Like maybe in a Lex and Tyson James kind of situation where they did not convert until after they already had a couple of kids and he heard the screams of the damned while he was at a barbecue and he decided from then on that they they needed to be good Christians. So they've only been Christians for a few years. But they have drunk the Kool-Aid and gone way extreme, right? Real quick. So so I could see them coming into this seminar and being like, oh my gosh, we've been doing so much wrong. We need to study so much. We got to listen to Bill Gothard. He really knows what's going on. We don't have to think about this. We can just do this and, and we'll be good Christians. They give a quiz to recognize Satan's attacks. And it includes such attacks as it requires a lot of intellectual ability and training to understand what the Bible is teaching. Since the Bible is thousands of years old, we cannot expect it to have all the answers to our problems today. There are so many interpretations of the Bible that we cannot be sure our interpretation is correct. Since God had to use men to write the Bible, we cannot assume that the Bible is perfect. The Bible is only one of many helpful resources for the decisions we must make. So again, we're, we're stripping this down to one person, one book, one vein of thought. There, there is no careful consideration of multiple perspectives. It is, nope, nope. This one, that's the only one you're allowed to do. No, no questioning, no study. And what's crazy to me is they want these people to be missionaries, don't they? To, to share this gospel with others. And when you do that, people are going to have questions. And if you've never done analysis of your beliefs, you're just going to be saying, oh, well, because the Bible said so over and over and over again. And, and you're not going to actually answer the questions that these people have. And you're not going to be an effective minister. So, again, it feels like they are pushing so hard that they completely miss the point. So, I love that these are Satan's attacks. It does take intellectual ability and training to understand the Bible. It was not written in our time. It was not written in our language. It, it is interpreted in millions of different ways. Clearly, it is not obvious what the correct interpretation of the Bible is. So having that intellectual ability and training is important. I mean, that's why there is a Bible degree. We've had Bible degrees for hundreds of years. No, longer than that. Because even... Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, all of them, they they went and got theology degrees. So there has always been a, a faction that are interested in actually studying the Bible and having a, a good grasp of why they believe what they believe and supporting it with long trends in the Bible, not just one sentence. And then there are so many interpretations of the Bible that we cannot be sure our interpretation is right. Like seriously, that that is like the most accurate statement ever. I, <laughs> this is why it is so hard for the deconstructed to talk to those that are still in the church because fundamentally I see that as an obvious truthful thing that is not an attack of Satan it's just what it is so when they're looking at it and they're saying oh my gosh you can't believe that like when you you disagree on such fundamental things there really isn't a whole lot of discussion to be had. I mean, you could quibble about minor variations, but nothing significant. 
the Bible is only one of many helpful resources for the decisions we must make. I mean, the Bible doesn't have food recipes in it. It doesn't teach you how to drive. Like, again, I see this as something that is very obvious. Like, yeah, yeah, the, the Bible is a helpful tool. Is it the only tool? Not by a long shot. But of course, they're going to look at it strictly from a spiritual view and say, well, yes, of course it covers all decisions. So yeah, that, that, is, that is the struggle between the deconstructed and the non-deconstructed. On rebellion, Satan is a real person who fell because he wanted to be out from under any authority. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Ah, uh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yes, yes. Okay, so my favorite part of the book. This, this is hysterical. Okay. So they instruct the father to have a symbolic meal. You can tell this was written in the 80s because of what they suggest. Uh, gelatin molds, celery stalks, potatoes, wheat bread, a lemon wedge, unleavened bread, and steak. So this carb loaded uh, dinner here has has very specific spiritual meanings. The gelatin molds indicate that we have a God designed mold. Uh, then we have celery stalks. Apparently, I, I need to test this out. But apparently, if you store celery covered, it will stay sweeter. And if you store it uncovered, it will become bitter. So the celery stalks are a reminder that we need to be under God's covering and authority or we become bitter. The potatoes start underground and later come to light just as our actions come to light. Except you have to dig up the potato. The potato doesn't sprout on top of the world. Like it's, it's in the dirt. That's why they're covered in dirt when you get them at the store. Then we have the wheat bread. The wheat must die to create the bread. But cooking anything would apply to this. Why not some veggies? There's, there's, the celery stalks are not enough nutrients. Add some broccoli, maybe some mushrooms, you know, a little onion. Um, then we have the lemon wedge. The lemon wedge. This is to remind us that suffering is bitter, but if responded to properly, it will bring cleansing. God chooses the best suffering for us. God chooses the best suffering for us? What happened to the verse that said, I have plans for you, plans to prosper, But he's going to choose the best suffering, the best suffering, because there, there is such a thing as the best suffering. Come on now. Come on now. Next, we have the unleavened bread, because that is there to remind us that yeast is a sin. I, <laughs> I truly do not know why yeast is a sin. Oh. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, we do not have leavened bread at Passover. Um, we have unleavened bread then to to represent the the quick uh, fleeing of the Jews from Egypt, but it's not sinful. It's it's representative of a historical event, not a moral thing. So I, I don't know why they say yeast is, is sinful. That Finally, the steak. This is a clean animal under Mosaic law because it chews its cud. And, and about the hooves. Uh, but we should similarly ruminate on scripture. I, I heard this so many places where we need to chew the cud of God's word and really ruminate on it, but we don't meditate. We don't meditate. We ruminate. And 
I took that to heart really well. And I thought it was a good thing until I was an adult and I was ruminating over anxiety and having massive intrusive thoughts and took years of therapy to get that under control. I think just personality wise, I am a very introspective person. So I probably would have noticed it without the religious programming, but uh, the religious programming just reinforced that I need to ruminate on the things that I have done wrong. Now, here's another list of common deception. Primitive tribes are not from some prehistoric stone age. They are the remnants of great and advanced civilizations which rejected God's moral laws. Uh, it is never right for public news media to violate God's moral standards. Reporters should use facts to emphasize the truth of God's word, not as neutral information. Criminals are not the victims of social injustice. Alcoholism is not a disease, it's a sin. And a person's health is influenced more by guilt and bitterness than by food, sleep, or exercise. And in response to labor organizing, they quoted this verse. Proverbs 22.10 Drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insults are ended. So asking for a livable wage is quarrels and insults. So we are going to take a break here. Um, I will continue with more of the men's volume one in another video. I don't want this to get too terribly long. I think it is important to talk about extreme situations like this because we need to be aware of what those problematic pieces are, the root cause of those problematic pieces. So that way we can kind of guard ourselves from being taken in by a cult. <laughs> 